Our author affirms that in this two or three things are asserted by the presbytery which are not matter of fact. The first instance that he gives is that the assembly in ratifying the proceedings of that commission commended and thanked them for their great zeal, faithfulness, and diligence. Quote, now says he, in giving their zeal and faithfulness, the epithet of the great, this was out of the common form, and more than any of our assemblies used to do in approving their commissions, unquote. But our author is very much mistaken, for the epithet of the of great is sometimes given to the zeal, faithfulness, and diligence of the commission, and sometimes the epithet much, and this will be found to be a frequent and common form for a considerable time after the revolution. And the difference between great zeal and much zeal is not very material. Very material. The Assembly 1703 approve of their commission for their great uh, for their great pains and diligence in the affairs referred to them. The Assembly 1700 approve of their commission for much diligence and faithfulness. So the Assembly 1697 use the term much, and the Assembly 169 uh, the Assembly 1695 commend two former commissions as evidencing in in their proceedings much wisdom and commendable zeal. Likewise, the Assembly 1701 approve of the proceedings of the commission of the former Assembly as evidencing much wisdom, zeal, and faithfulness. Another mistake that he charges the Presbytery with is that they say sometimes matter of less moment, matters of less moment have been particularly noticed. Upon this, he observes that in approving the commission in all our acts since the Revolution, the Assembly have never noticed any affairs in particular. It had been more for our author's honor if he had consulted the registers more exactly before he had charged the judicial act and testimony in such broad terms as asserting things that are not matter of fact. For the Assembly 1714, in their approbation of the proceedings of that commission of the former General Assembly, do deservedly take particular notice of the zeal of that commission against popery and a popish pretender, expressed in that excellent paper, their seasonable warning, which approbation is recorded among the printed acts of that year. Also the General Assembly, 1735, approve of the preceding commission, and, in particular, they got the Assembly's thanks for their care in causing application to be made of the King and Parliament for the repeal of the Patronage Act, as is to be, as is to be seen in the Act of the Unprinted Acts, in the Index, excuse me, of the Unprinted Acts that year. Whether these things are of less moment than the Union is not the present question, but it may be safely said that the address of the Commission relative to the Union deserved at least an equal regard. Our author, on page 98, after his usual manner, makes a retreat to our reforming period and tells us, For as momentous an affair the solemn acknowledgment of public sins and engagement to duties, drawn up by the commission of the Assembly 1648 was, yet the Assembly 1649 never took the least notice of it. But our author might have known that the covenant was sworn with the above acknowledgment of sins and engagement to duties according to an act of the commission and with concurrence of the estates of Parliament by all ranks of persons in Scotland before the meeting of the Assembly 1649, and consequently the commission's act had the particular and express approbation of all the synods and presbyteries, yea, and of all the ministers and members of the Church of Scotland before the said meeting of assembly. Therefore, there was not the least occasion for the assembly 1649 to make particular mention of it in their act approving the proceedings of the said commission. But we find that they make a reference unto it once and again as a deed approved and justified by the whole Church of Scotland, as, for instance, in their seasonable and necessary warning, July 27th, Session 27, they have these words, quote, It is matter of exceeding great sorrow to think upon the ignorance and profanity, the impenitence and security that still abounds in the land, notwithstanding of our late solemn confession of sins and engagement unto duties, sealed with the renewing of the covenant and oath of God, unquote. And in their act, Annette Catechizing, July 30th, Quote, the General Assembly taking into their serious consideration the great darkness and ignorance wherein a great part of this kingdom lieth, together with the late solemn engagement to use all means for remedy thereof, do ordain, etc. Unquote. Our author then writes at random, as I have observed he frequently does, when he tells us that the Assembly 1649 never took the least notice of the solemn acknowledgment of sins and engagement to duties. Whether he has read the Acts of Assembly or not, I shall not determine, but if he has read them, he seems to me to have designed a designed a palm unto, uh, upon the world that the assembly 1649 
had as little regard to the renewing of the covenant as the present judicatories seem to have. I might likewise here observe that the author of the essay is also mistaken when he affirms that in our old acts from 1638 to 1650 there is but one instance of any particular deed of the commissions of the several assemblies noticed, that is, that which he mentions in the year 1648. I shall not give the reader the trouble of transcribing, but refer him to our author, <clears throat> refer him or our author to assembly 1645, session 18, and assembly 1649, session 19, where he may see that the deeds of several commissions have been particularly noticed by several assemblies and other instances might have given, that might be given if it were needful. The seceding brethren, in their Act and Testimony, page 41, observe from the index of the unprinted Acts, 1690, a declaration made by the moderator, quote, that the assembly would depose no incumbents simply for their judgment and that the government of the church, unquote. The presbytery add, quote, that it is they, that is, the assembly by their moderator, declare that the perfidious prelates and their underlings were not to be dis were not to be deposed for their treacherous defection from the covenanted principles of this church, unquote. Upon which our author, essay page 90, explains the above assertion of the presbytery in the following manner, quote, As if that one principle simply of a man's being for prelacy was enough to depose him from the ministry, though as holy as Cran Cranmer, Ridley, etc., unquote. But these, of whom the moderator of the foresaid assembly speaks from the chair, whereas the presbytery observe perfidious prelates and guilty of a treacherous defection, but such were not Cranmer and Ridley. If I should transcribe the apology that our author makes for that assembly, I believe any reader of ordinary capacity might think I impose upon his understanding. As, for instance, when our author tells us, quote, that the moderator might declare as above, while perhaps the major part was against it, though they might see meet to let it pass at that time, or it might be the moderator's mind, this was fact, and yet he labored under a mistake, unquote. But tis obvious, even to the weakest capacity, that as the moderator's declaration stands recorded in the assembly's books and pointed out by the unprinted acts, so the above declaration behooved to be the mind of at least the major, the major part of that assembly, and stands upon record as a deed of the same. The author of the essay, page 151, charges the judicial act and testimony with five or six things that are not matter of fact, when it declares in page 40, quote, that it was the laudable practice in reforming times to condemn all steps of defection, and duly to censure such as were guilty of backsliding, unquote. I shall not weary the reader with transcribing. If he pleases, he may compare what our author calls mistakes with what I have observed already in the, in the former chapter concerning the difference betwixt the proceedings of the Assembly 1638 and these of the Assembly 1690, and he will readily see the injustice of our author's charge against the Presbytery's act and testimony. Neither shall I insist at this time on any other of our author's particular exceptions against the said judicial act and testimony. I doubt not, but every unbiased and unprejudiced reader may see that they are of the same kind with these that I have noticed, that is, such gross misrepresentations that favor much of a spirit disobliged or irritate against the, uh, the seceding brethren upon some one occasion or another. I cannot omit to take notice of one other particular instance, and that is the treatment he gives to my reverend brother, Mr. Mayor. Essay, page 117, quote, To affirm, says he, the judicatories of this church have done what in them lay to pull the crown off Christ's head, refusing to give him the glory of his supreme deity, is an unaccountable and groundless charge unworthy of the weakest, unquote. And upon this margin he mentions Mr. Mayor, second test, page 113, when our author gives a reverend brother who is very well known in his neighborhood such a diminutive character it argues such a bitterness of spirit blended with such quantity of pride and self-estimation, as I shall not say, is unworthy of the weakest. But I may say, tis not like common prudence or ordinary civility and discretion, especially when it may be found that the charge, as it is laid by the Reverend Mr. Mayor, is not so unaccountable and groundless as our author alleges. 
To support the above charge, our author puts the following questions. Quote, did it not lie in their power to declare the positions charged against Professor Simpson are truths and not errors? Did it not lie in their power to censure any that would call them errors? Was it not in their power to con commend him as teaching sound doctrine? Unquote. The plain import and meaning of the above queries was not in the power of the judicatories was it not in the power of the judicatories to declare that the great God our Savior is not the independent God, is not necessarily existent, is not self existent, and that the three persons of the adorable Trinity are not one substance in number? It may take one, it may make one tremble to think what liberty this author takes unto himself in the above, which he no doubt reckons to be pugnant queries. I wish he had writ with more sobriety upon such a grave and weighty subject. But in answer to his above queries, if the judicatories had declared in the above manner expressed by our author, their declaration would have been a bare-faced and expressed voting of our confession of faith to the door. And I doubt if it is in their power to do so while the Act of Parliament 1690 ratifying our confession of faith stands. But yet in the meantime, if their conduct and behavior towards Mr. Simpson, and if their management of that process is considered, they have, as I already observed, stripped our confession of faith of one of the principal ends and designs of confessions of this nature, though in the meantime it must be held some way or other since it is ratified by the laws of the land. I must further observe that our author cites our brother Mr. Mayer's words after his ordinary partial manner when the Reverend Mr. Mayer asserts that the judicatories had been doing what in them lay to pull the crown off Christ's head. He adds, quote, refusing to give him the glory due to his name, to give him the glory of his supreme deity by resenting suitably the blasphemous denial of the same, and instead thereof, have even kept the blasphemer in full communion with the church and refuse all calls to lay to heart or acknowledge their sin in this, unquote. These are the Reverend Mr. Mayer's own words, and I ought to have been quoted and ought to have been quoted by our author if he had designed to treat him with candor. But it is upon such partial quotations that our author builds his leading arguments from authority. But for further clearing of Mr. Mayer's expressions, let me suppose that I should say that the Reverend Mr. Curry, author of the essay, has done what lay in his power to weaken the authority and reputation of the Assembly 1638, as well as the authority of other assemblies of that period. Our author, according to his above way of reasoning, might reply, Did it not lie in my power to defend the cause of the prelates? Did it not lie in my power to approve of their declinature of the Assembly 1638? Did it not lie in my power to declare them a treasonable and seditious meeting as King Charles I by his proclamation did? But if our author, or if any who has writ against the Assembly 1638 as he has done, should speak after this manner, it might be safely told them that they had now declared themselves openly to be what really they were, even enemies to the work and interest of Christ in Scotland. And it might be likewise told them that they spoke in an arrogant manner, as if they were independent on God, or without the restraints of his adorable providence. And this I take to be imported in the above queries proposed by our author. And as for the Reverend Mr. Mayer's expressions, they only import that when the judicatories did not particularly and expressly condemn the several erroneous propositions vented by Mr. Simpson, and when they did not suitably resent the blasphemous denial of true deity from of the Son of God, but screened and protected Mr. Simpson from the censure he deserved, and, instead thereof, kept him in full communion with the church, they could not have done a greater injury to the deity of his person in a consistency with that profession which they continue to make. As for what our author subjoins, that the assembly in their act suspending Mr. Simpson have plainly asserted the proper supreme deity of our Lord Jesus, I, already, I have already observed in the postscript to the printed letter, page 37, that our modern Arians will acknowledge a proper supreme deity in the person of the Son in a consistency with their own scheme, as also that Mr. Simpson will subscribe to the words of the above active assembly according to his own sense and meaning of them, without disclaiming his darling proposition that the terms necessary existence, supreme deity, and title of the only true God may be taken and are by some authors taken in a sense that includes the personal property of the Father and so not belonging to the Son and therefore I shall not further insist upon it in this place.